Yeah, it says live on YouTube here, so that's good. Good. It's not finished setting up at my end, but at least it's working. Okay. Good. So folks, for those of you who just joined, just basically the structure of our meeting is that we've got the talk on the astronomical filters first, we've got the break, and then the second half of the meeting is just observations. We have 10 different people doing observations. And um, the way it's gonna work is that if somebody has a question for you, um, they're gonna type it in the question and answer. I'm not gonna be monitoring the chats. I'm gonna read the question out because we are recording the meeting. Um, that way that the question gets captured and then we can capture your response, okay? And we're now posted on Facebook in the event page and I'm now recording. So uh, I'm just about ready to uh, share screen and, um, and go live, we'll wait till 7.30. Okay, that sounds good. I worry right now because I'm getting more complacent the third time round. <laughs> I hope that's Glad you were experience. able to change the start time. That would have been an early start this morning at 7.30. <laughs> yes. I've done that I've been, before for meetings too. It's I've been warned to not to change it, but I couldn't figure out why the problem. And sure enough, there was no issue. Yeah. And I have checked the future meetings and they are PM. Yes. <laughs> So you're in there okay, Paul? Yes, I am, Dave, thank you. Okay, yeah, your audio is good. So we're gonna get everybody to mute themselves then until it's your turn at the, towards the end of the meeting, uh, or I can mute you. Here, I'll go ahead. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna go live now. Okay. Chris, is my sound good? Yeah, you're sounding good. Okay, okay folks, welcome to our uh, June 5th meeting of the Ottawa Centre. Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. A special welcome to other RESC centers that might be joining us here this evening. So before we proceed, I will go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So just, just uh, practicing good security here when we're on Zoom. Um, we do not monitor the uh, chat box during the meeting. But somebody, nefarious person, may try to come in and put in links and things like that in the chat box during the meeting. So please uh, do not click on any links that are posted in the chat box. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please use the Q&A box at the bottom. And what will happen is that I'll be monitoring that. And as a question comes up and it's appropriate and at an appropriate time, I will read the question out so that it does get captured in our recording. And then we can hear the response uh, from the panelist. Next slide. Okay, so here's tonight's program. Um, we're going through the introduction right now. I've got a 10 minute astronomy news. I've got the Ottawa skies for June. Jim Thompson's gonna be talking about his filters, part three. And we have so many observations that the second section is going to be just observations. 
uh, right after the break. We're going to have our standard M&M challenge over the break. It'll be a five minute break. And uh, we got some amazing pictures uh, that have been submitted for this month. So without uh, further ado, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so welcome new members. Uh, the, uh, we've got uh, six new members there. So we've got Abu Sis, uh, Jeff Burney, Ernesto Luke, Bernja Chalrik, Michael Sauchgau, and Jonathan Falbo. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name there. We have members in the news. So congratulations to Robert Dick, who, whose article on uh, general scotal biology uh, about uh, light pollution. And uh, please uh, check out his article in the June edition of the RESC journal. And to remind you that uh, this coming Sunday, we're having the virtual general assembly. And we've got special guest speakers starting at 11 o'clock on Sunday, uh, right through until two. And then the, uh, the actual uh, annual general meeting takes place at 6 p.m. Um, and I believe you need to pre-register for that. And you also need to know your RESC membership number in order to attend that meeting. Dave, if I can intervene for a second, it's Chris. Sure and just remind people that the times you just listed and the times on this dis uh, screen are in Pacific time because the GA is in Vancouver. Oh, uh, okay, so good point. You want to uh, add three hours to these and I'm quite sure I have already added three hours when I put the note there about 6 p.m. for the AGM. Okay, uh, all that information is available on the RASC.ca website as well. Okay, next one. Okay, 10 minute astronomy news. So first slide, please, Chris. So this, uh, this article is uh, from uh, ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, an article that I found, I thought it was quite interesting. And uh, I've got a bit of an interest in radio astronomy. So this is sort of right up my alley. So uh, after an intergalactic search lasting more than two decades, an Australian led team of scientists say they have finally found the universe's missing matter, solving a mystery that has long stumped astronomers. Since the mid 90s, scientists have been trying to locate half of the universe's ordinary matter. They believed it was out there because of clues left over from the Big Bang, but it had never been seen. What we're talking about here is what scientists call baryonic matter, which is the normal stuff that you and I are made of, said Associate Professor Jean-Pierre Macart from the Curtin University node of the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. Astronomy is full of missing stuff, most of the universe is understood to be dark matter and dark energy, which nobody has ever directly seen. But even more of a mystery for astronomers was that they couldn't find out about half of the ordinary matter in the universe. It's been a true embarrassment that we haven't been able to find it, said Professor Xavier Prochaska, an, an astronomer from the University of California in Santa Cruz. Astronomers have been looking at the universe using all sorts of different forms of light, from radio waves to X-rays and visible light. None of them revealed the missing matter. That was until they started to measure fast radio bursts, brief flashes of intense energy found racing across the universe and discovered the missing matter hiding in the cold dispersed gas between galaxies. Intergalactic space is very sparse. The missing matter was equivalent to only one or two atoms in the room of the size of an average office, Dr. McCart said. Fast radio bursts, FRBs, were first detected in 2007, but are not fully understood. As FRBs travel across the universe, they're dispersed and slowed down by the matter they pass through. Each frequency of radio energy is slowed down differently by that matter. I'll get the next slide, please. So just like a prism spreads light into a rainbow of colors, each with a different frequency, the missing matter in the universe spreads the FRBs out into different frequencies. By studying how far away the origin of the bursts were and how much they have spread out by the time they reach the Earth, the scientists were able to figure out how much matter was sitting between the galaxies. Repeating the process with six different FRBs coming from different parts of the universe, the team was able to figure out how and where the missing matter was. The results were published on May the 27th in the scientific journal Nature. Um, and go back to the previous one there, Chris, and I run the video. Hopefully there it goes, okay. It was a great feeling to have that measurement and to know something 
that you think only a small number of people in the world know to put it to bed a cosmic uh, mystery, Dr. McCart said. So this is showing how the, uh, the matter as it encounters it does uh, modify the, uh, the frequencies. There we go, okay, so next slide. Seeing such tiny changes in the FRBs required a mammoth effort using a combination of massive radio and optical telescopes. The team used the CSIRO Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, an array of 36 radio telescopes in Midwest of Western Australia. Combined, the dishes equate to a single radio telescope with a 4,000 square meter dish. That's a good sized radio telescope. Next slide, please. They have the ability to look at a huge area of the sky in high resolution. That means without knowing where an FRB would come from, they were able to capture it and analyze exactly how spread out each wavelength in it was. Then the aptly named Very Large Telescope in Chile measured the distance between the Earth and the galaxy that the FRB came from. With those two pieces of information, the researchers are able to determine how much matter was in the otherwise empty space that the FRB passed through. Next slide, please. The discovery still leaves much of the universe undetected. About 85% of its matter is thought to be dark matter, that which is undetectable using ordinary methods. I, I like a mysterious universe. It means there's much more to be understood, Dr. Mark Hart told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I think it's really exciting, said Professor Tara Murphy, an astronomer from the University of Sydney who was not involved in the research. It's the first step to using fast radio bursts to probe the invisible universe, she said. Dr. Mark Hart said the next step was to get an intricate understanding of this newly found matter using a hundred or more FRBs. The thing that we've discovered is the atmosphere of the universe, he said. It's the ecosystem in which the galaxies live. He said by understanding its precise structure, astronomers would be able to better understand how galaxies were born and what happened to them when they died. It will be like a medical image of the universe, he said. Thank you. Okay, so let's take a look at the Ottawa skies for June. So here are our moon phases and uh, as would happen tonight is a full moon, which we will not be able to see because we have a thunderstorm rolling through Ottawa right now. Um, and we have the new moon on the, uh, on the 21st. We have uh, Comet Swan. And where this little orange arrow is on the left-hand side here is, is approximately tonight. It's pretty low in the sky. I believe it's a, it's a morning object, very low in the horizon. And I think we might even have some images of this uh, particular comet. So that's the, that's the path that it's taking right now. Well, we're moving towards the longest day of the year. And as you can see, the, uh, the sun rise and sets, so the, the length of the days are certainly getting longer. And uh, June 20th, 21st, we're gonna have the longest uh, day of the year. Then things will improve for us. The dust skies get darker earlier. Next slide. Mercury. Um, uh, I did send an email out to the group. The greatest Eastern elongation was uh, yesterday. I'm not sure whether we're able to see it in Ottawa. It looks like there were a fair amount of clouds up there. Um, probably you'll still be able to see it for the next day or two. Um, as just after sunset, I uh, look for it in the uh, western sky. Venus is visible in the early evening and then the early morning. It's uh, setting earlier and earlier. Uh, by the end of the month, uh, it, uh, you'll have to watch for it in the, in the morning. Mars is uh, visible currently before sunrise. Jupiter is visible late evening and through the night. By the end of the month, uh, quarter to 10, uh, Jupiter will be rising. So probably by, uh, yeah, about 10, 15, 10, 30, you'll, you'll be able to see Jupiter in the evening skies towards the end of the month. Saturn is visible uh, late evening and through the night. So right now it's uh, rising at midnight. And uh, by the end of the month, it'll be rising at 10 o'clock. Uranus is uh, visible uh, before sunrise throughout the month, as is uh, Neptune. And here is our cartoon of the month. 
Okay, we'll move on then. Okay, gives me a second here. Okay, Dave, it's Chris. I'm going to stop sharing so that uh, Jim can take over sharing. Okay, not a problem. Everybody can see that screen, all right? Yep. Great. Okay, well, welcome everyone to part three of my presentation series on understanding astronomical filters. Tonight, I will discuss what I call special filters, those that do not strictly fit into the two categories I discussed in the first two presentations, namely color filters and light pollution filters. Specifically tonight, I will discuss the following special filter types. UV IR blocking, neutral density, those for planetary observing and imaging, chromatic aberration correction filters, something called a neodymium filter, and finally solar filters, uh, breaking that up into both white light and extremely narrow band. So in general, these filters all draw upon the same technologies as the other filters I've discussed. They use a combination of absorption and reflection to achieve their desired spectral response. They are designed to fulfill very specific tasks, which can sometimes mean they won't see a lot of use in your toolbox, depending on your observing habits. Because of their specific applications, they are also not very many vendors for these types of filters. And as a result, they can be rather expensive. The first special type of filter to discuss tonight is the UV IR blocking filter. This filter type is intended for imaging only since the human eye is not sensitive to these wavelengths of light. UV IR blocking filters are used to pass only the visible spectrum resulting in sharper and better focused images. This is so because most lenses and telescopes are designed to properly focus only the visible spectrum, not ultraviolet and infrared as well. Included in this group are so-called color correction filters. And you can see the spectral response for a couple of examples in the uh, plot on the right, the, uh, the blue and the purple curves are examples. Their purpose is to modify the spectral response of a camera sensor to make it more like the human eye. All commercially available digital cameras today have some sort of color correction filter installed. Unlike the other special filters I will discuss tonight, UV IR filters are very common and are readily available from many different retailers. A word of warning, however, that many of the filters available today have a poor response to hydrogen alpha. Take, for example, the uh, color correction type one shown in the blue curve. If you look at the response down around 656 nanometers, you can see that it's a pretty poor response. It's down around 10 or 15 percent. And th that is pretty uh, typical of commercially available camera color correction filters. So if you're looking to buy a UV IR blocking filter for your kit, pay attention to what the filter spectral response is to make sure that it has good hydrogen alpha response. Of the many different brands that I've encountered, the one sold by Bader Planetarium is one of the better performers. And that uh, is the green curve on the graph there. That's a example from Bader. The next type of special filter to discuss is the neutral density filter. This is a purely absorption type filter whose purpose is to attenuate the brightness of the object you are observing uniformly across all wavelengths. They are available in a variety of optical densities or OD, meaning you can usually find the right filter for your application. 
percent luminous transmissivity or percent LT of a neutral density filter can be calculated from the optical density using the equation shown here. So for example, if the filter has a optical density of 0 0.6, that works out to a transmissivity of about 25%. Another option for reducing brightness is something called a variable polarizing filter. This filter is in fact two linear polarizing filters stacked on top of each other. As you rotate one filter relative to the other, you change how dark the filter is. Many observers prefer the flexibility of a variable polarizing filter over having a selection of neutral density filters with various optical densities. The next category of filter to consider are those met for planetary observing. Historically, astronomers have used color filters in an attempt to darken planet surface features and make them more visible. By applying interference coding technology to this problem, unique filters that accentuate multiple surface features simultaneously can be created. Something a simple absorption type filter could never do. There are a number of planetary contrast enhancement filters available commercially, most of which are designed specifically for improving the view of Mars. In my experience, these filters work, some better than others. But just like when you're using color filters, the improvement is very subjective. Of the filters I've tried, none really stand out as being all around better than a simple color filter. I also have a general caution regarding the transmissivity of these filters. Many of these filters cut a very large percentage of the incoming light, making them unsuitable for smaller aperture telescopes. For example, the Orion Mars filter, shown with the purple line on the graph to the right, I've personally found too dark to use even with my 8-inch schmidt cassegrain For those who are interested in imaging the moon or the planets, there is another type of special filter that may be of interest. These filters take advantage of the fact that cameras have a wider spectral response than our eyes. This opens up an opportunity to image the planets using wavelengths of light we can't normally see. Infrared pass filters are very popular because of their ability to steady seeing conditions to provide much sharper images. You can see an example on the upper left, the moon imaged at various wavelengths with the infrared image being the sharpest. They can also be used to view features that are not visible in other wavelengths of light. I especially like to use an IR pass filter when imaging the moon, especially when imaging from inside the city where the seeing is normally quite bad. UV bandpass filters are also popular for their interest for those interested in imaging structure in the clouds of Venus or for imaging different distributions of elements in the clouds of the gas and ice giants. There are few vendors of UV bandpass filters, so they do tend to be a little expensive. The next category of special filters is that meant for the correction of chromatic aberration. Different wavelengths of light bend or refract by different amounts in the glass medium, such as a lens. When designing a glass lens for a, a telescope or a camera, this fact results in all the colors of light not coming to a focus at the same point, leaving the resulting image blurred by a violet, blue, or sometimes red fringe. Centuries of lens design has struggled to correct this problem, culminating in the multi-element exotic glass apochromatic refractor. Apo refractors, however, are still expensive to manufacture, putting these high-performance telescopes out of the reach of many amateur astronomers. The more affordable runner-up in performance is the achromatic refractor which although better than a simple spherical lens still has some chromatic aberration. 
When viewing bright objects like the moon or planets, this aberration is often visible enough to hamper your viewing. As you can see in the image in the bottom left, the difference between an apochromatic view and an achromat view, the, the uh, violet fringe is quite visible in the achromat view. The solution most commonly used is to add a filter that removes the unfocused violet blue end of the spectrum. These filters commonly go by the name of fringe killer or minus violet. You will find that these filters are more effective when used during imaging since camera detectors are more sensitive at the UV end of the spectrum than our eye. There is benefit to be gained, however, using these filters visually. I have personally used the beta fringe killer, which is the, uh, the red curve on the plot there to the right. I've used it on my 80 millimeter refractor, and I can confirm that the filter does what its name suggests. If you are looking for a cheaper solution to chromatic aberration, try using a yellow Rattan number eight filter, shown by the yellow curve on the plot. It should help. Using a color correction filter, you should be prepared for the fact that your view will have a yellow color cast. Depending on your specific telescope, the increase in sharpness and contrast may be worth the false color. A category of special filter that I have already briefly mentioned in my other two presentations is the neodymium filter. The concept of using neodymium, a rare earth element, to infuse the glass in an astronomical filter is somewhat serendipitous. The resulting glass media has multiple pass bands in the visible spectrum, and by some strange happenstance, the end result is a surprising increase in perceived contrast. These filters are available from a number of manufacturers and they provide good contrast improvement with high overall transmittance. I personally use the Bader brand moon and sky glow filter shown by the red curve on the plot. Whenever I view or image the planets or the moon in color, there are a number of variations on the basic neodymium infused glass filter that tailor the filter for different applications. Some have interference coatings added to provide UV IR blocking, making them good for imaging. Uh, the Bader filter is an example of that. Some have additional blocking in the violet, violet blue end of the spectrum to improve the performance of achromatic refractors. The purple and the yellow curves on the plot are examples of that, also made by Bader. All in all, they are a curious family of filters that are worth having a closer look at. Note, however, that even though some manufacturers say that these filters provide light pollution reduction, the amount by which they do so is negligible. The last special filter category that I will discuss in this presentation are those meant for solar observing and imaging. Astronomers have been looking for ways to safely observe the sun longer than they've been looking at the stars and planets. As a result, there are a number of different options available for use today. The main problem is that the sun emits a large amount of energy, not just in the visible spectrum, but in the UV and IR bands as well. In fact, only 45% of the solar radiation reaching our eyes is in the visible band. The simplest and probably the oldest method of viewing the sun is with a pinhole camera. By putting a small hole in a piece of cardboard, you can project an image of the sun onto a screen and safely view it. This works surprisingly well, a good science project for your kids. However, it can be hard to see the projected image in the broad daylight. This concept can be taken a step further by using a normal refracting telescope with an eyepiece to focus even more light onto a projection screen. The resulting image is brighter and has more contrast. However, it will 
end up heating up your telescope and eyepiece. It is not recommended for larger aperture refractors and not at all on reflectors. It was John Herschel, the only son of famous astronomer William Herschel, who first proposed the idea of using a wedge-shaped piece of unsilvered glass to split off a small portion of the incoming sunlight from his telescope for safe viewing. The uh, sunspot sketches in the figure on the lower right are in fact sketches made by John Herschel using one of these devices. The wedge prism splits off less than 5% of the incoming sunlight, dumping the other 95% out the back of the prism. The reflected 5% is then passed through a neutral density filter to reduce the light intensity to a safe level. This system, now called the Herschel wedge, was further improved by Ignazio Porro in the late 1800s by placing a, the glass wedge at an angle to polarize the reflected light, thus allowing a rotatable line polarizing filter to be added to give adjustability to the brightness. Herschel wedges are still available today, and many users are convinced that they give the best light views of the sun, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. I have one myself. The main drawback of Herschel wedges is that all of the sunlight gets focused inside of your telescope, causing potential heating problems. They are therefore only suitable for smaller aperture refractors below four inches and definitely not suitable for any type of a reflector, be it a Newtonian or a schmidt cassegrain Another drawback is that Herschel wedges tend to be rather expensive in the $500 to $800 range. Luckily, filter coating technology has come to the rescue of reflector and large refractor owners. Depending on how much money you are willing to invest, you can choose to go the way of white light observing which can be rather affordable, or narrow band observing, which tends to be rather expensive. Both systems use an energy rejection filter, or an ERF, to remove 99% or more of the incoming sunlight. In white light systems, the ERF takes the form of a mylar film or a glass filter with multiple layers of a metallic compound coated on it. The earth is easily mounted over the sun facing end of your telescope and can be full aperture or spanning the full diameter of your objective or it can be off axis spanning only a smaller diameter circle to one side. Off axis earths are usually recommended for large aperture reflecting telescopes, anything bigger than six inches as it removes the loss of contrast due to the reflector's central obstruction. And the effective increase in focal ratio helps reduce the appearance of atmospheric distortions. A big advantage of front mounted earths is that they eliminate any risk of overheating inside your telescope. White light earths are affordably priced and can be purchased from manufacturers like Bader Planetarium, A Thousand Oaks Optical, or Orion telescopes. The white light filter also gives you the ability to add a bandpass filter to your setup, allowing for study of the sun using different wavelengths of light. Extremely narrow band solar observing systems are specially, <coughs> sorry, use specially designed earths that are precisely matched to the narrow band pass filter. The most common type of narrow band system used for the sun is hydrogen alpha, but there are, older, there are other pass bands used as well, such as calcium K or sodium. Calling the H alpha filter narrow band is an understatement. A narrow band hydrogen alpha filter for deep sky imaging has a pass band around three to seven nanometers wide, while for solar observing, they are more like 0.02 to 0.09 nanometers wide. Now, up to this point, I've been calling these devices filters, but strictly speaking, they are not filters. They are something called etalons. 
Both function using the same principle of the interference of light, but implement the idea differently. As in an interference filter, light enters an etalon, passing from air into the optical media, often glass, and partly reflects, partly refracts at the boundary between air and glass. Some etalons use an air space between two semi-reflective coatings instead of a clear glass media. By carefully selecting the distance between the semi-reflective layers and their reflectivity, the etalon can be made to selectively pass a particular wavelength of light. The passed wavelength can be further adjusted by either varying the distance between the layers or rotating the etalon relative to the incoming light. This is an important characteristic of etalons as it allows the observer to tune the etalon to account for wavelength variations in the hydrogen alpha emissions coming from the sun. You maybe haven't thought about it, but the relative speed difference from one side of the sun to the other due to its rotation is enormous on the order of 14,000 kilometers an hour. This speed difference, plus that caused by the Earth's rotation and its orbital velocity, all result in the wavelength shifting up or down away from the nominal hydrogen alpha emission line. This is a characteristic that was first predicted by Christian Doppler in 1842. As one can imagine, the precisely applied reflective coatings and the ability to finally adjust the spacing or orientation of the etalon makes these devices very expensive. Earth plus etalon packages for small aperture telescopes range in price from $800 to several thousand. The cost of buying these packages separately has made solar scopes such as those from Lunt or Coronado with the Earth and Edelon fully integrated into the scope, another possible alternative worth considering. There is no doubt that these narrowband systems provide by far the best views of the sun. Whether or not the view justifies the cost is a decision you will have to make for yourself. So my final words, uh, this concludes the three part series on astronomical filters. I'll be happy to ask any questions that you might have. You can find copies of the presentations and a lot of other material on filters at my website. The address is shown here and uh, you can feel free to contact me by email after the meeting if you have a question about filters. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll okay, Jim, I've got one question here. Sure. Sure. So uh, first question, varying the air pressure and the air gap will also tune the etalon, is that correct? I am not positive how the the uh, pressure tuned works. If it's if the pressure changes the distance between the etalon surfaces, or if it's changing the angle, that I don't know. Okay. The uh, I do know the expensive systems sold by Daystar in the U.S. They actually vary the temperature of the etalon, and by increasing its temperature, they can make the material expand and vary the distance uh, very finely. Okay. But the pressure tuned, I'm not sure. Okay. Are there any other questions? No, I think that's it. So thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome. Okay, folks, we're going to take a five minute bio break. But we do have a Messier and Moon challenge for you to ponder while we are taking that break. So Chris, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so there's your Messier object and there's your Moon object. See if you can figure out what they are. And the answer will be in five minutes.
One minute to go. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. Our five minute break is over. Let's see how well you did. Okay, so our Messier challenge is the Eagle Nebula. And I believe we might even see that again tonight. And uh, the moon was Poseidonus, uh, the, the creator Poseidonus. And uh, hopefully you got one or both of those. So we're gonna move into our observations. Um, just for the folks who are the panelists here, um, actually go to the next slide. Just take a quick look and see what order you're in. I will call you out uh, as it's time for you to come up. And I'll also spotlight your uh, video um, so that uh, people can see your face while you're talking about these things. And folks, if you have questions about the uh, videos, or about, sorry, about the uh, pictures, observations, uh, please type them in the question and answer box and I'd be happy to pass those on to the speakers. So first up, we have uh, Jim Thompson. All right. Thank you, Dave. So May was a very busy month for me for astronomy. Uh, it started out with Astronomy Day on the 2nd, which was a great success. And we also had many lovely clear evenings in May. I got out six evenings in total during the month, four of which were all night sessions going from 9.30 to 3.30 in the morning. Being springtime, I focused mainly on observing galaxies. I have a selection here uh, captured from my various sessions through the month, uh, some of my favorites. All of these were taken from my backyard in central Ottawa. So the first group of galaxies are all face-on spirals. I like the fact that there's a lot of variety in the shape and structure of these galaxies. You, you never know what you're going to find uh, as you're exploring through all of these, these galaxies. Uh, we have examples of uh, classic spirals like M51, uh, which happens to be the one of the observing challenges this month, or uh, M99, which I hadn't observed before actually, before the night that I caught that image. They all have clearly defined arms with dust lanes and star forming regions, making them very uh, interesting to study. Some more unusual galaxies like M66 or M96 have a more distorted structure or oddly shaped spiral arms. I also happen to catch two of the supernovae that are visible right now, uh, one in M61 and one in uh, NGC 4567-68, which is a pair of interacting galaxies called the twins. All of these were captured using my 10-inch Ritchie Kretchen with a focal reducer to give a focal ratio of about six. I uh, captured the images using my Mallencam Skyreader DS432 monochrome and an Optolong Night Sky H-alpha filter, which is essentially an infrared high pass filter that I chose to use in order to cut through all of the light pollution in my backyard. Uh, these are all uh, 20 to 25 frame stacks at 25 second exposures a piece using 6% gain on the camera. Uh, next image, please. So this is a, a collection of edge on spiral galaxies that I observed uh, in May. Again, there's a 
big variety in the shape and the structure of the galaxies that are out there to observe. Some have very prominent central bulges like M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, or NGC 4565, which is known as the Needle. Others are very long and thin with no discernible bulge at all, such as NGC 4217 or 4302, which is the, uh, the edge on one in the picture, the middle right, where there's two galaxies shown. In some cases, the details in the dust lanes are also visible, like in M108, the surfboard, NGC 3628, the hamburger, or 4627, the whale galaxy. I observed uh, several dozen galaxies over the course of a few nights, but there are many, many hundreds more to explore. So I can't see getting tired of studying galaxies anytime soon. <laughs> uh, next image, please. So uh, this is one of the observing challenges for the month. I believe it's the difficult one. This is Leo 1, a dwarf galaxy. Uh, you can just make out the uh, scattering of stars in the middle of the frame. This is a small satellite galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. It's about 820,000 light years away and it's thought to be one of our galaxy's most distant satellites. It has um, about 20 billion solar mass, which puts it at just over 1% the mass of our galaxy. And it's uh, a difficult observing challenge because it is so uh, diffuse and spread out. Plus it, it's very close to the bright star Regulus in Leo. And you can actually see the glow at the bottom of the frame and the diffraction spikes from that star uh, just off the edge of the screen to the bottom. Uh, next picture, please. So this is an area of the sky called the Coma B Galaxy Cluster. It's a really fascinating area with many, many galaxies visible. The cluster is thought to have at least a thousand identified galaxies in it. It's located about 321 million light years away, and it's one of two main parts in the much bigger Coma supercluster. In this image that you see, most of the points of light are in fact galaxies. And if we go to the next picture, you'll see I've annotated the image with a circle around each galaxy to just let you know how many are in there. So the red circles are all the galaxies that are in the NGC or IC catalogs. The blue are galaxies that are in the PGC catalog, but only down to about magnitude 19. So I count in this one picture 173 galaxies, not including anything in there that's dimmer than 19 magnitude. So pretty, pretty cool <laughs> when you think about it. Uh, next image, please. So this is my image of Hickson 50. Canadian astronomer Paul Hickson published the catalog of compact galaxy groups in 1982, the, galaxy, the catalog that bears his name. It contains 100 compact galaxy groups ad identified by Hickson from photographic plates. Astronomers are interested in compact galaxy groups because they readily show the effect of dark matter. Since the visible matter is not enough to hold these groups together based on their, their speeds. Hickson also noted that most of the groups contained active galaxies, galaxies in the process of interacting with each other, and ample amounts of intergalactic gas and dust, making them also very interesting targets for study. Amateurs use these objects as observing challenges, with number 50 being the most challenging as it is by far the dimmest in the catalog. I was able to achieve 11 of the Hickson galaxy groups in one evening. I believe it was on the 22nd of May, with number 50 being my favorite. It's located in the sky very close to M97, the Owl Nebula in Ursa Major, but it is very far away, about 1.7 billion light years. The five members that you see here in the uh, enlargement 
range in magnitude from 18.4 to 19.7, which is quite dim and why it is considered one of the most challenging Hickson objects to observe. Now I also happened to catch a number of even dimmer galaxies in this image. And fr a friend of mine, Denis Legault, helped me to identify one of them, PGC 662088, which is also shown in its own enlargement. And it, if you can believe it, has a magnitude of 22.2. .2. So not too shabby from my light polluted backyard, I have to say. Uh, moving on to the next image, please. So this is my last deep sky image to share this month. It's a bit of a tease as it is traditionally a summertime object. You have to stay up pretty late or early as the case may be um, to see this object. It, uh, it's not high enough in the sky to observe until um, you know well after midnight. But if you wait a few months, it's going to be well placed high in the south. It's one of my favorite objects. It just has so much uh, lovely st structure and, uh, and contrast in it. I captured this using the same scope, a 10 inch Ritchie Crechain, but I, I used a color camera, a ZWO brand ASI 294 with a multi narrow band filter to cut through the light pollution. And my final object, the final image rather. We can go to the next picture. Thank you. Is of the moon observing uh, challenge for this month. It is the Archimedes crater. It's the large crater uh, just to the left of center in this image. This picture I actually captured in February of 2018. Uh, I didn't, haven't had an opportunity to do much solar observing this month. It's a 81 kilometer diameter crater and it's located on the eastern edge of Mare Imbrium. It has a well-defined rim with terraced inner walls, but the floor has been completely flooded by lava at some point in its history. So it's a nice smooth flat bottom. If you look carefully, you can notice there's a difference in brightness and texture of the mountainous region to the south of the crater. You can even see some of the original uh, secondary impacts in, in the uh, terrain resulting from when Archimedes was formed. So presumably this was some high ground that is sitting above the level of the lava that flooded the floor of the Imbrium basin. It's kind of ne neat to see the, the difference in the texture. Another interesting feature is the is the area around uh, Hadley Rill. And let me see if I can pull up uh, annotation tools. Hey, there we go. So it's not a very good color, sorry, but that is where Hadley Rill is. And this area right here, hopefully you can see the little red cross I'm making. That is the location of the Apollo 15 mission landing. They landed there with their little buggy and they drove all around that area, exploring the edge of the rill the, uh, and the escarpments in the area. So kind of a, an interesting part of the moon to observe as well. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hey, Jim, got a question. Sure. How far away is that 22 magnitude PGC galaxy? That I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't, sorry. Somebody will, have to, somebody will have to, far. Okay, that's far. good answer. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, we have Gabriel next. Hi, everyone. Just... So um, this is, uh, am I un unmuted? Okay, good. Yeah. So this is my first uh, imaging session with my telescope. So I've only been doing it for a few months. So bear with me if the color correction is not quite on point. I'm still working out a few technical, technical kinks. So this is M51. Um, and we also see um, the NGC 5194, which is the smaller part of, uh, of that galaxy, the small uh, right next to M51. And we also have um, a star, which I annotated. Can I can you just go to the next slide? 
All right, so here are the annotations. So we see all of them from the Tyco catalog, and we see obviously M51 and uh, its replacements right, right, right beside. So next slide, please. All right, so this is M81 and M82. Um, this was about nine hours of uh, integration. I'm using a four inch Apple uh, refractor. So next slide, please. So these are the annotation for that. We see there's a lot of stuff in that, uh, in that frame. So next slide, please. All right, so this is the lunar challenge for this one. For this month, um, this was done with uh, the next image 10 camera. So I do have a bit of color. Uh, it's less detailed than uh, than than Jim's uh, than, than Jim's capture because it's only a four inch. So uh, we have to live with that. So next slide, please. All right. So this is my first attempt on the elephant trunk. Uh, again, this is about two to three hours integration. So not a lot of detail, but uh, I think it was a great first attempt on that target. So next slide, please. Again, the annotation. Again, there's a lot of stuff going on there also. Next slide, please. All right, so we have M101 and NGC 5474. Um, this again was done with a QHY 163M monochrome camera. And uh, I'm using this uh, the Bader two inch filter as uh, Jim mentioned. The, uh, for the luminance one, the two inch from Bather, the UV and IR cut works pretty good for uh, deep space and using that using that in the luminance challenge in the luminance channel. So next slide, please. Again, so we have the annotation there. So next slide, please. All right. So this is the Iris Nebula. Um, this for the luminance challenge. This was actually my first uh, visit to the, the Fred Lasting Observatory. So I was able to run at a good two or three hours of just luminance over there. And I've added the data, the color data from uh, what I took from my backyard, which is about Bortle 4.5 4 to 5. So it's it's still kind of good, but uh, I found that at the Fred Lasting Observatory, I, I get like two or three times more data for the same amount of, uh, of sub exposure. So next slide, please. Again, so those are the annotations for, uh, for that target. So next slide. And I believe that's it. Uh, for the annotation, if you want to know, those are made with uh, fixed insights. So once you have your image solved, uh, you can generate all the layover for that. It, it's very it's very quick and it's, uh, it's very good. It saves a lot of time instead of doing all the manual annotations. So that's all for me. And uh, I'll, my, I might have some better one next month. Thank you very much, Gabriel. That's great. So uh, next person is uh, JS. Yes, hello. So, um, like Jim, I uh, captured uh, Leo One. Uh, my uh, re just recently kind of started. Um, oh yeah, sorry, see me now. Yeah, so just uh, recently um, got back to astronomy, kind of, kind of like last year, and I uh, bought a, a a daub and a ten inch Dobsonian, and found you know I can't see too much from my backyard, so I decided to throw some uh, some technology at the problem. So. Uh, Few months later, I'm the owner of uh, two different uh, astronomy cameras, a planetary and a one-shot color. So, um, so this one was the first kind of try with my uh, ASI 294. Um, yeah, so it's a nice, nice, uh, nice uh, target actually. As kind of see it slowly pop out as as it stacks. Uh, and as Jim was saying, you can you kind of see regulus out of the frame there with the uh, the, the rays coming up. So it's a that's really really nice and challenging target. So uh, next, uh, please. Uh, yeah, so this one here, um, actually, I was playing around with my uh, with my planetary camera, actually. So it's a very sh small field of view. That's uh, M51. Um, I mean, the picture has lots of uh, imperfections, but I like the uh, the amount of detail that we can see with the, the dust lanes and, and the detail in the arms and uh, whatnot. So yeah, I was actually uh, quite happy with that one. Um, next, next, please. So these are yeah some of the supernovas we can see right now. So I actually got uh, three of them. Uh, the first one, uh, yeah, 2020 uh, JFO in M61. So that one was only actually discovered in the beginning of May. Uh, so it actually shows a nice uh, color contrast with the there's a like a line of foreground stars in there, and the uh, the supernova is really kind of bluish compared to them. Um, well, according to, to the camera and, and the color correction, anyways. But it's it's a uh, it's a nice one to observe. 
Um, so, and actually that galaxy, as I was reading uh, reading up on it, it's actually the eighth supernova discovered in that galaxy since, since the 20s. So it's uh, quite prodigious for, uh, for uh, supernovas. Uh, next, please. So this one, um, yeah, so, so 2020 FQV. Uh, the, supernova is, the supernova is a bit dimmer. Uh, it's in the Siamese twin uh, galaxies. Um, uh, another one. Oh, sorry. So just a. Uh, um, yeah. So um, what was I saying? Uh, yeah. So there's a nice uh, satellite trail going right through it, um, but um, didn't go quite slice the galaxy in half. So uh, it's nice. Uh, nice little supernova. Quite dim. Um, so next, uh, please. This is another one, uh, 2020 HVF in the NGC 4568 in Virgo. And that one's very interesting because the supernova, supernova totally outshines the, the galaxy. The galaxy is a very dim little smudge there, but um, that, that, that's not a star. That's actually a supernova in that galaxy. So I was quite uh, impressed at seeing that. So it's about uh, magnitude 20 for the, the supernova. So the, the galaxy is uh, even a bit dimmer uh, and, and quite small in angular size as well. Uh, so next, um, next please. Yeah, so this one's uh, of course uh, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, you know, the Cygnus and the, the Milky Way is just starting to come up in, in the um, in the east now, I guess. So it's uh, starting to be visible above my uh, uh, from my backyard above the trees and whatnot. So it's one of my favorite areas of the sky. Uh, so I uh, quite a good night with the nice seeing and got some nice detail. Uh, just for 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 uh, detail, so so all the pictures are taken through my um, my ten inch uh, Dobsonian Sony uh, an Altaz uh, mount, so it's not an equatorial mount, it's just an Altaz mount with uh, stacking. Uh, pictures are about fifteen to twenty seconds each, um, and all the pictures are taken with an ASI two ninety four color, except the M fifty one, which is with a uh, quite an ex inexpensive um, SV Boney. Uh, uh, SV305, I believe it's called. So it's an IMX290. Uh, it's, it's a planetary camera, but I, I used it for quite a bit of deep sky stuff. It still works. Um, all right, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we've got uh, Jim Sophia up next. Thank you. Well, one of my favorite planetary nebulas, N27, uh, was taken with uh, an eight inch Smith Cassegrain and a Mallencamp Sky Raider, uh, DS10C, using the Optolong Ellen Hans filter. Uh, this is a stack of five 25 second exposures, and the image was lightly processed with Topaz Studio. Next slide, please. So this is M101, and I took this image off my balcony a couple of weeks ago using Deep Sky Stacker for the first time. With my Altaz mount, field rotation is noticeable as I uh, point closer to the zenith. And M101 was at an alt altitude of uh, 70 degrees. On a previous occasion, live stacking at 20 second exposures at the at 20 second exposure rate continuously uh, resulted in big swirling uh, star trails. So this time I collected 60 frames at 20 second exposure each, and I stacked them with Deep st uh, Sky Stacker afterward. I also used an uh, astronomic uh, UHC filter, which works well on galaxies when you're in a light polluted city. So Jim T, thank you for the suggestion to use this program as an alternative for getting a stacked image, especially when conditions call for it. Next slide, please. This is M106, a stack of eight 20 second exposures. And I took this image in the Moose Creek area last, last year, and I'm hoping to revisit M106 again this year. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Next one is uh, Gary Boyle. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been a while since I've shown some pictures. This goes back to a moonrise of August 14th of last year. Um, you have to have all your ducks in order to get a moonrise. Of course, no cloud at all on the horizon. So I got pretty lucky on this one. All right, next slide. 
In the, on December 1st, I decided to try um, some stacked images of the Rosette Nebula. I took only a few subs, uh, a couple minutes each, and uh, using an iopton tractor, uh, tracker, but I plan to do um, uh, more, more stacks uh, this winter. I'm really waiting. I'm not waiting for winter around the corner, that's for sure. Next slide. <clears throat> Oh, with the pandemic, we're staying home. My wife and I work from home. Uh, what else are you going to do? Help with the gardening, uh, rebuild the, the good old fire pit, take pictures of the crab apple tree. But then when it gets clear at night, what else are we going to do but image the sky? Next slide, please. So I've set up my, um, my Canon uh, uh, 450D on uh, the iopton, iopton tractor, uh, um, powered by uh, from Joe Bonner. On a, huge uh, mead mount. Believe me, the wind does not move this sucker, that's for sure. The next couple of images will be taken with the 50 millimeter uh, prime lens uh, f1.4, not this one over here. But, uh, that's the, uh, the 24 millimeter. I use my 50 millimeter on the next two. Um, so uh, on to the Milky Way. Next slide, please. Oh, as I said, 50 millimeter, uh, this is a combination of three three-minute three minute images on the uh, ioptron. I call this um, 443. It's F4, ISO 400, three minutes. I only did three of these, but uh, the next night when I wanted to try to do more, it got a little cloudy, so I couldn't do any more subs, but uh, I plan to do more uh, over the next few months. And the last slide coming up is, uh, I was very surprised on this one. Next slide, please. There we go. This is the heart of the Milky Way. It's called the Via Lactea. And that was Roman for the road of milk, which we call the Milky Way. Milky Way consisting of about 300 billion stars. The number fluctuates back and forth. But uh, this is the same 443. Uh, six images, six subs only for a total of 18 minutes and stacked on Deep Sky Stacker and processed with uh, Elements 10. So uh, very pleased on this, taken from uh, South Mountain, Ontario, live uh, in the beautiful countryside. So I'll plan to do more of these uh, this summer, but uh, the, uh, the image just below center is the Lagoon Nebula. And as you come higher from the center is M17, the Swan. And the top pink one there is the uh, the Eagle Nebula, which uh, we saw just previous. That's it for me. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, coming up, we've got uh, Bob Olson. There you go, Bob. You're spotlighted. You're muted, though. Can't hear you, Bob. There we go. All right, here we go. Am I live now? You're live. Thank you. Uh, May was a fantastic month for uh, uh, getting getting out. I managed to get out 12 days in, in imaging on, on in, in May alone. Anyway, this is my image that you've seen several times already. This is M61, a supernova, and um, it's. Uh, I took it on it, the the supernova became was first noticed on May 8th. And I imaged it on May 13th, 21st, and 23rd. Uh, it was still pretty bright on all those days. And um, it's, it's a type two. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, whenever you image a supernova, the first thing you do is you go and see if you have an image when it wasn't a supernova. And I found one of my files in 2015 that I took. And uh, there's no supernova and we'll not play uh, Where's Waldo. Can you show the next slide, please? Yeah, the supernova is right there, uh, missing in, in, the, in the 215 and the 2015 picture. It's a type two uh, core collapse of a massive star uh, and a massive star being eight to 50 solar masses. Uh, fusion produces energy in any star where hydrogen turns into helium and so on. And when it reaches iron or and nickel, uh, the fusion does not produce any more energy. And so what can happen is 
the energy being produced by the fusion, it doesn't hold up the star anymore. And when the core reaches about 1.4 solar masses, it collapses. And boy, it collapses hard and fast. It goes screaming in toward the middle of the star at about 23% the speed of light. And uh, this compression produces temperatures of 100 billion degrees uh, Kelvin. Uh, then it crashes into the neutrons uh, that have, were, were produced in the, in the collapse and it bounces off. It, it, it hits and rebounds off and uh, the shock wave accelerates the rest of the star, the stellar material, uh, to, its, to its escape velocity and the star explodes. Um, uh, during this very brief time element, uh, the higher uh, elements with uh, higher um, atomic weight than iron and nickel are produced. And uh, so when we say that uh, uh, we are, you know, the products of star, uh, uh, we are basically supernova stardust, that's what we are. Uh, that's really correct. And depending on the original mass of the star, uh, it will form either a neutron star or a black hole when it's finished. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, in looking at my files, I noticed back in 2009, I had actually taken another picture of uh, M61. And uh, next slide. That is another supernova from, 19, uh, from 2008, actually. I took the picture in January. The supernova actually was tailing off at this time. It was in 2008. Okay, um, next slide. You've seen this several times already. This is uh, uh, UGC uh, 5470. It's a dwarf galaxy, part of our local group. Um, I included uh, uh, the star that it's next to and blasts it out. Uh, anyway, the next slide, please. So that's what we're looking at. That's a dwarf galaxy. It's uh, about 800,000 uh, light years from here. And, you know, I can't even imagine how you'd see this visually, but apparently people do. Uh, I, can't, I can't even guess what. Next slide. And you can see Regulus is a, almost a magnitude one star. And there's this little galaxy sitting there off to the side, still visible even next to, next to Regulus. And uh, next slide, please. Each of those arrows is pointing at another little galaxy. So it's a pretty galaxy rich area. It might be sort of fun if there wasn't Regulus there. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is a a Able uh, 36. I had never heard of it before this. And um, so whenever I haven't heard of something, I always sort of look it up and I looked up an image uh, from a guy I know called Adam Block and uh, his picture was fantastic. And uh, so I decided I'd give it a try. And uh, I forgot that Adam images from Tucson on top of uh, Kip Peak. And uh, so this is really down in the mud uh, of, of the Southern horizon. And you are looking at seven hours of exposure to see this. I can't even guess how you'd see it. I think it's like 16 magnitude, 16th magnitude, uh, and it's a planetary nebula. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. But I never saw it until I started stacking images together. Even my subs didn't have much in them. Okay, next image, M51. Um, this is the very first object that I ever imaged. And uh, so I, I sort of have a kind of a romantic attachment to it. Um, and over the decades, I have actually imaged this seven, over 70 times. That's not true. I have pointed my camera at it 70 times. It's definitely an all time favorite. Uh, this picture here was taken this May and it's a, a combination of seven nights of imaging. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna turn over to Paul Cleninger and uh, he, he hasn't changed his name. I'm just, uh, he does not have video. So I'm just going to that's what he looks like, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I, th I, thought, I thought you were trying to pretend uh, you were me uh, there, Dave. Uh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I trust you're all doing well out there. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, we've been fortunate to have some pretty nice, clear nights uh, during May. And so I've got a few images uh, to share with you as well this evening. Last month, I mentioned that we had the possibility of observing a bright comet in our morning sky in mid-May. But like Comet Atlas in the previous month, Comet Swan started to take a dive in its brightness about two weeks before it becoming accessible to us here in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see here on the chart that the comet reached peak brightness just around the beginning of May, by some accounts attaining a magnitude of about plus 4.7, which would have made it an easily visible object to the naked eye. But there it stalled and started to decline. So by May the 13th, when it started to become possible for us to actually see it here, it had already dropped by at least one magnitude. Coupled with the fact that this was at an extremely low elevation for us, observing it visually became a no-go for sure. Uh, I was out on several nights as indicated here and uh, to see if my camera would fare better than my eyes. So I've got a few views here. Next slide, uh, please, Chris. So this was my first night out trying to capture this little beastie. Uh, it was quite clear, but there were low thin clouds hugging the horizon. And so I had to wait a bit until the uh, comet climbed above those to, uh, to get a look at it. Next one, please. Yeah, and there it is. Waiting those few extra minutes though also meant that the dawn sky was brightening rapidly, uh, making uh, seeing or imaging this thing even more challenging. While the camera caught it with uh, with a 200 millimeter lens, I tried seeing it with 15 by 70 binoculars, uh, but I'm not certain that I did. Probably more wishful thinking. Next one, please. So by May the 19th, the comet had climbed a little bit further above the horizon by the beginning of dawn, and so the chances of seeing it should have been better. Unfortunately, it also dropped by about another half magnitude or so, making it even dimmer. Uh, this view was taken with a, just a 50 millimeter lens on a stationary tripod, and you can see that on that night too, there were some patchy thin clouds sailing through. Uh, I was initially uh, surprised by the bright streak in the view, but zooming in, I uh, saw that it was just a meteor trying to fool me. Next one, please. Yeah, the comet was much more subdued, as you can see here. Uh, having the bright star Algol very close to it, though, certainly made it easier uh, to point my binoculars for a view. But even then, uh, I'm still am not certain that I saw it. Uh, again, it might have just been a bit of uh, wishful thinking. Um, next one, please. So this view uh, was, was really my best night of imaging for this comet. It came about two weeks ago on May 21st. Uh, the comet, again, was a bit higher in the sky by the start of dawn but uh, it also decreased just a little bit further in its brightness. Uh, the bright star to the left is uh, Algol, and I took this with a 420 millimeter lens and a Canon 60DA camera. And it's a combined stack of uh, 16 60 second auto-guided exposures. Next one, please. So zooming in for a bit of a closer look, you can see that the comet was displaying very little of the uh, long impressive gas tail that was prominent to observers in the Southern Hemisphere only a few weeks prior. It had, however, developed a shorter broad dust tail seen to the, just to the right of the coma. I did manage to see the comet through my binoculars this night, although just barely. It really wasn't much brighter than the background sky and just looked like a small fuzzy patch. Given, uh, given the decreasing brightness of Comet Swan, I decided against any further imaging attempts, especially since the month's uh, moonless window was uh, going to be closing soon. And uh, there were certainly other objects uh, of interest in this month that were, that were calling to me. Next one, please. One of those was Comet Panstars. Uh, Panstars was uh, originally discovered way back uh, uh, back in two, 2017 out near Jupiter, and it's taken a while to, to get reach the inner solar system, but uh, uh, it was uh, projected to reach close to its uh, projected maximum brightness this month, and, uh, and it was much higher in the sky uh, well before the beginning of dawn than, uh, than Comet Swan was. So uh, next one, please. You can see that it was also sailing through a, a pretty interesting region up near the Big Dipper, close to the familiar M81 and M82, as well as the smaller disrupted elliptical galaxy NGC 3077. 
and also uh, IC 20, 2574, which is a dim dwarf spiral galaxy, also goes by the name of Coddington's Nebula. You can see that down near the bottom. So I'm going to zoom in on that portion of the sky. Uh, next one, please, Chris. Here you get a better view of the comet. And uh, as for Coddington's Nebula, as I said, it, it, is, a, is, it, it is a dim dwarf spiral. Um, and interestingly, it's believed that about 90% of this uh, galaxy's mass actually consists of dark matter. Uh, the comet itself, you can see, displays a, a long slender gas tail, uh, similar to what Comet Swan coulda, woulda, should have been. Anyway, it was, uh, it was nice to, uh, to have a, a comet like this uh, up in a much higher portion of the sky to get a much, much clearer uh, view of it. So uh, the month wasn't all uh, lost for comets. Next one, please, Chris. A little further afield, like you've seen before, I, I uh, with with, some, with a few of the other folks, uh, I also managed to image uh, supernova twenty twenty JFO up in M sixty one. Um, this is a magnificent uh, barred spiral galaxy in in Virgo, and uh, this image was only taken uh, thirteen days ago. And I believe the the supernova is actually still visible using a telescope. I'm not entirely certain of that. I haven't heard any updates on it recently, but I believe it's probably still visible. Um, next one, please, Chris. So I didn't have any previous images of M61 to compare. Uh, I searched through my archives, but I guess this is the first time I shot M61. But I did find one from that I thought would be uh, uh, an appropriate one to show you. This is, this is one from our old friend, Paul Commission, taken uh, coincidentally almost exactly 10 years ago. So I've overlain it here and uh, note the position of uh, the supernova in my image. And uh, next one there, please, Chris. There's, uh, there's Paul Commission's uh, image of, uh, of M61 from May the 20th, 2010. Uh, and you can see, uh, you wanna, actually you can't see the supernova in this. Uh, now you see it, now you don't. And if you go for the next one there, Chris, now you can see it. So you can see where, where the blast has occurred. And honestly, it, it never ceases to amaze me that we can see an exploding star from 53 million light years away. Uh, I'm certainly glad that this one didn't pop off anywhere near our, uh, near our solar system. <laughs> that would have been a bad hair day for sure. Okay, the next one. Uh, I also managed to to bag the Leo One Dwarf Galaxy. Uh, this is uh, this is really a challenging object for a number of reasons. It's it's a dwarf spheroidal, and as as Jim also mentioned, it's uh, the most distant satellite galaxy to our own Milky Way at about 120,000 light years away. The challenge in observing this object is is really twofold. It has a very low surface brightness, and making it obviously quite dim. Um, but it's uh, but even worse, it's it's situated only about a third of the moon's apparent diameter away from the bright star Regulus. So the sc star's glare can easily swamp this uh, this this very dim galaxy. Uh, if you're just trying to see this galaxy visually, it's usually easiest if you place Regulus just outside the field of view, as as you saw in in a couple of the previous images. Uh, I've included Regulus here just to illustrate how overwhelmingly bright it is in comparison to the galaxy. I mean, Regulus will easily record in a few seconds with most cameras. And this is a stack of four 600 second exposures taken with an 80 millimeter ED APO uh, and a CCD camera uh, just to record that, that very faint galaxy. So uh, an interesting object there and uh, definitely a challenge. Uh, getting a little late to see that now. Leo is getting pretty low in the, in the west. Uh, uh, I'm not even sure if it's still visible up uh, by the end of uh, twilight there, but uh, uh, next time around, uh, when it comes around, uh, certainly worth a, a peek to see how, see how determined you are. All right, and the last one I have, Chris. This is uh, this is uh, the obviously the Orion Nebula. This is one of the images that was part of the processing segment in the astrophotography workshop that we ran on Zoom on May the 9th. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the folks that made this uh, workshop possible. The workshop uh, was was very successful. Uh, the Zoom session was amazing. Um, we didn't have really any technical glitches and uh, we reached quite a lot of folks with that. Um, 
Mike Mogadam and I started talking about this workshop back last September. And in making this happen, he spent a lot of time organizing the event and answering tons of emails for me. So thank you, Mike. Um, Paul Sadler aided in the project significantly by organizing and running the uh, survey we, uh, we initially did and also producing the final videos, which uh, um, I believe are now available on the, uh, on the uh, RASC Ottawa website um, for members to, to download. So uh, if you've got, uh, in this time of COVID, if you've got five or six hours to spend uh, listening to me yak about astrophotography and you wanna try your hand at processing some of these images, uh, those files should be available. I should, I should try to confirm that um, and uh, they will be available to all the members, whether you signed up for the initial, um, the initial workshop or not. Uh, we've decided to make them available to uh, all members of the club. Uh, Mick Wilson also handled all the website work and uh, thank you, thank him for that. I also want to thank uh, Pamela Wolf for getting us the classroom back at Carleton University back in March when we tried to run this initially. You remember those times before, before the COVID era? Uh, yeah, we only were able to run the first session uh, and, uh, and uh, when it came time for the second session, it was already a no-fly. Uh, here in Ottawa. So uh, as a result, the reason I mentioned that the, uh, that the videos are uh, five hours long is that we did a, I did a recap uh, in the first segment uh, of, of that session back in March. So it's basically almost a full recap of, of that first session. And then the uh, second session, which runs for the three hours, is, uh, is uh, concentrated on the, on the uh, image processing side of things and has uh, three exercises uh, ranging in levels of complexity. Uh, uh, and the last one was this one here, the, uh, the Orion Nebula. So uh, it was an interesting exercise. Uh, if you wanna try your hand at it and uh, using, uh, using the freely available and very capable GIMP uh, image processing program. And last but not least, uh, Chris, I want to thank you for, uh, for driving the Zoom Starship. Uh, you've made all of this, uh, not just in our workshop, but in our meetings, uh, uh, much more easy. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad that we have this, uh, this outlet to uh, still reach out to one another and share the things that, that we're doing. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so we're on to uh, Taras. You're spotlighted. You need to unmute yourself. There you go. Just did. Hi. Um, hello, this is my rendition of uh, uh, the Swan Comet. Um, it was indeed um, a really difficult object, as uh, Paul described. Paul gave uh, a great analysis of uh, uh, behind the, the comet's uh, appearance in our northern hemisphere. And unfortunately, it was really difficult uh, to see it because it was too low above the horizon, but also the comet itself was really dimming quite fast. So this image was taken uh, on May 20th. Um, this was early hours, about maybe 3.40 AM. As you see, the sun was close to the rise and um, uh, when looking for the comet, it was uh, twice as disappointing because of this thick layer of clouds along the horizon, which I did not see until the comet was much higher. Uh, the comet was higher, the sun rise was uh, closer, so the background is still quite bright, but um, I'm proud, like you can see the um, left, on the left from the comet, the bright star of, uh, the, the bright star called um, Algol. If I'm not mistaken, so I, I'm happy that uh, it showed up at least as a recognizable smudgy um, dot and um, uh, it was quite an experience. Next slide, please. So this was uh, uh, taken on May 23rd, a few days after that, from a place um, with a wide open west horizon and, uh, sorry, east horizon in this case. No, sorry, my bad, west. This is the uh, sunset. And you can see a very, very thin slice of um, uh, moon. Um, this is the uh, moon of, again, May 23rd, which had a special significance for Muslims. It was uh, the beginning of the holiday uh, Eid Mubarak. So um, 
what also is interesting is that above the moon in the upper right corner of the picture is Venus. Uh, the higher resolution version of this picture shows uh, the Venus as a very thin crescent. And even more to that, if I had a lens which had a bit wider ang uh, angle, then above Venus, maybe same distance or half of a distance between Venus and Sun, but uh, up, there was uh, Mercury as well. So um, this uh, is quite a rare event when uh, Mercury is higher than Venus, but it was, um, if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, okay, yeah, so before we go to Mercury, this is the Venus, what it looked like back then. You can see it's very, very narrow uh, crescent, quite large in size, actually. This was 55 arc seconds in a diameter in the sky, and it's uh, from uh, the same time where the previous picture was taken, so it's on a blue background of um, uh, evening sky. Uh, it was very close to the sun. It's getting even closer now. Around this time, I think it's around more or less the location where the sun is itself. So we will not see Venus until late June when it starts reappearing uh, during the uh, sunrise hours. And um, I also took a video. This is a vid visual range picture, no uh, filters because planet was quite big. I stacked this and um, you can clearly see the nice tiny crescent of this planet. Let's go. Next slide, please. Um, so Mercury, Mercury was just above the Venus and um, it's a rare beast. It's difficult to catch it because it's close to the sun and um, it uh, circulates quite fast. But because it's an inner, in, with regard to us, a planet, which is between, the orbit is between us and the sun, so it has the phases, same like an, uh, as a moon. So this picture was taken on um, May 20th or 23rd, if I'm not mistaken, when um, this, the, the face was half illuminated, I would say, waning phase. And uh, I'm happy that this actually showed up like this because, uh, again, the latitude, so, sorry, the elevation was quite low and uh, the the challenge is there to, to catch that, especially as you can see it also on a, a quite a bright background. Let's go to the next slide. So with the span of next few days, I was uh, trying to get the better picture of Mercury because it was next every few days it would uh, be a little bit higher above the sun. So you can see the progress, how uh, the image improves because the planet is higher, a little bit higher. Uh, it wasn't too high, it was about maybe 15 degrees, but still with the help of um, a uh, filter which corrects for the um, uh, dispersion, I managed to c correct the, the that rainbow-like uh, appearance of the planet. And you can see a bit of a change in the size as well from um, uh, 8.4 arc seconds on May 23rd to around eight arc seconds on June 1st. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Mars, so this is 8.7 arc seconds diameter, right? Uh, actually, this is not right now, this is May 21st. And um, it was visible, it is visible now, in the southeast, it's still quite small, but uh, what I like about this picture is that you can see the uh, polar cap on the top and a little bit of uh, some uh, details on the surface of the planet. It's still quite small and uh, barely distinguishable, but that night when I took this uh, and other planets was really excellent seeing, uh, which rarely happens. So um, uh, I, of course, didn't miss a chance to take some other pictures. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And um, Saturn, also the same night, May 21st. Uh, this was about 41 arc second uh, size uh, with, if, if, you, um, if you add the dimensions of the rings as, as well, you can see a bit of, um, it's a uh, moon on the top. And uh, I didn't expect this because it's still quite low. This year is actually not too good for planets. Both um, Saturn and Jupiter will not be rising higher than 22 
uh, degrees from our uh, latitude. So um, I was quite happy that night again was great seeing and it did show the details, a little bit of uh, the surface details and the double nature of the rings. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And uh, Jupiter, so this was again 22 degree elevation. This diameter is about 46 arc seconds. This picture was taken earlier on May uh, 13th when the seeing was not that good, but um, it still show, showed up a little bit of details in the bands. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And uh, the same night on May 21st, however, this, with a great scene, um, there were quite a few events happening with um, uh, Jupiter. First, you can see there is a Ganymede, if I'm not mistaken, uh, passing between us and the planet and casting a shadow on the surface of the planet. Uh, the, there are other uh, moons, one on the left and two others on the right. And I was taking that in the span of like, like every five minutes uh, to see the dynamic uh, while it was still actually possible because this was early morning hours. And when processing these pictures, the last at the bottom, I noticed that there is something strange. Uh, the uh, one, one moon is missing. So as you see the next to the right, right next to the uh, planet, the moon is not there. Uh, I thought it may be something to do with uh, maybe the noise level, or maybe there was like uh, some smudge on a sensor, but no, it showed up clearly that uh, the moon is just not there. Apparently it's quite an interesting event. This is when the moon gets into the Jupiter, Jupiter's shadow. So you can see a bit of a shading in the, uh, how the planet is lit. The sun comes from the right, and when uh, it illuminates uh, the planet, the shadow, sorry, my bad, the sun comes, uh, the sunlight comes from the left. So the shadow is on the right and this is where the uh, uh, moon was. So let's go to the next uh, slide, please. This is, um, um, I, take, I took a look at that situation later with um, Stellarium and it showed clearly uh, the same location of the same uh, satellites, sorry, moons uh, uh, with regard to um, the planet. Um, and if you could play it, please, Chris. You can see how uh, Io or Io advances into the shadow and all of a sudden disappears. And that's what happens. So the moment when the moon gets into the shadow of the planet, uh, it has really significance because all of the sudden the moon is just not there. And it's significant to the extent that it was noticed by um, Danish astronomer Romer, who was observing the moons of uh, Jupiter. And he found out that the period during which Io rotates around uh, the planet is 42 hours, 29 minutes and three seconds. But he also noticed that some periods of the year this, there is a difference in this um, IOS uh, rotation um, uh, period uh, up to 30 seconds. So he didn't have an explanation and um, he actually showed his research and the results to this uh, astronomical society. And if I'm not mistaken, Huygens came with an explanation that this is because there is a limitation to the speed of light. So when we, uh, when Earth moves towards Jupiter. The distance between our planet and Jupiter is much smaller. So these disappearances, the fact of that disappearance, uh, when the moment when uh, the, the moon hits the shadow, um, it takes much shorter than when the Earth is on the opposite side coming away from uh, Jupiter. And this difference is as significant as 30 seconds. So uh, I, I'm happy that I managed to catch the fact which was quite unexpected because all of a sudden, uh, as you saw, the, the, the moon just disappeared from, from the view. Thank you, that's it. Okay, thank you, Taras. So uh, John Thompson, you are up next. Just unmuting. Your audio is not very clear there, John. Okay. Um, I thought I might be the only one who had 
I captured the conjunction between Venus and Mercury, but I see Terrasse had done it also. This was done on the night of May 22nd when the closest approach between the two planets happened. I also have another shot of the previous evening, May 21st, which was also the night of, of the new moon, uh, the, where Mercury was below Venus, about the same distance, but a bit further in and about a seven o'clock position. But these were fairly low in the west. You needed a fairly good west horizon in order to see these. Uh, next, next shot. Next slide. I also wanted to see if I could get a photograph or an observation of Comet Swan. So what I first did was I set up using Stellarium on the night of the 21st. And you can see my uh, up in the right hand corner of the settings, I was using a Canon XT and a 135 millimeter f2.5 telephoto. That's a nice combination. That's one of my favorite lenses. And I found, you can see that reddish uh, rectangle that if I put Aldol in the upper right hand corner, I could get not only Swan, but also the remnants of the Atlas. Like both of those were supposed to have been comets that uh, should have been giving nice performances, but both of them fizzled out as it happened. And I didn't know if it was possible, but uh, Stellarium, Stellarium was telling me that Atlas was magnitude 5.8, which made me wonder if it was perhaps possible to get those fragments. But I wanted to wait until the comet Swan at least was above 10 degrees. This uh, setting scenario shows them at 3.55 a.m. and it's about nine and a half degrees. So I thought I'd be a little bit after 4 a.m. And I actually shot it, but I got there early just in case get the setup. Oh, and, and normally I shoot these off of my back deck, but in this case, a uh, neighbor two lots over is some trees that were getting in the way. So I had to move to a, a side road about a mile away from my home. Okay, next image. So as this picture, I set up at 3.55 a.m., which is about the same as what that previous Stellarium shot was. And you can see that the even then the twilight was coming in. The sky to my eyes was darker than that, but I had to boost the brightness in order to see the comet at all. And you can see Aldol is up in the right-hand corner there. And then to the left is just barely see it as Comet Swan. And uh, one thing uh, I noticed that um, its position isn't exactly the same as, as what Stellarium predicted. Uh, the Stellarium showed it a little bit to the left of where it actually is, that it made it an angle of that line of three stars above it. It made an angle of slightly more than 90 degrees, and, and here you can see it's less than 90 degrees, which means either that Stellarium's orbital elements were a bit out of date, or possibly there's what were known as non-gravitational effects were happening. That's not unusual for comets, as the outcasting of a tail and form a, a jet reaction effect and make the orbit slightly different than what it would be if it was purely under the motion of the sun's gravity. And then off to the left, there's where the fragments of uh, Atlas T4 would have been. That I, I, Even if that tree hadn't been there, I'm sure it was too low. Like at that point, they were only about three or four degrees above the horizon. And by the time I had actually planned to get these shots, at between 4 and 4.10. By that time, the sky was breaking so much that it was impossible to get it. In fact, by 4, uh, 4.10 or even 4.05, Aldol wasn't even possible to see it. So there you go. There's uh, two fizzled comets. Well, there's actually like a, a set of fragments of comets of Atlas over to the left. And then I did zoom in to get a slightly better image. But uh, Next slide, please. And there in the middle, this comet Swan, you can see that it does have a slight uh, tail, like a comet image. Uh, compared to those stars in there, I estimated it at around eighth magnitude. Other people were estimating it at about 7.5, but again, like Paul, I, I couldn't see anything there with binoculars. It was virtually impossible because the sky was getting bright. And even five minutes later, it was impossible even to find Aldol to set up. The next one. And finally, this was one that uh, everybody else was imaging, and I decided to image it too. 
that's M61. And again, you can see the supernova. Um, several of the images, including mine, you see some knots in that arm to the left, right, which I believe are H2 regions. This galaxy is actually an extremely active one compared to our own galaxy. It's about 55 million light years away. It's roughly the same size and mass of our own galaxy. But unlike our own, uh, it's very active. It's called Starburst. It's, our galaxy has had eight uh, observed supernova in the past 2,000 years, which is an average of one every 250 years. This one has seen eight supernova since, uh, I think it's 1926, uh, about 100 years. So you can see it's a much more active. This, again, this is the eighth supernova. And then the next one, I just uh, annotated it to show where the supernova was. Oh, next slide, please. Just pointing out the supernova. Uh, I saw somebody else's image. It was taken four nights before this one. And his image showed the supernova was about the same brightness as the star below it. So you can see it's dimmed slightly. But this one was taken on the night of May 23rd. And I think that's the night that a lot of people were doing it. This is a total of about 18 minutes of exposure. There was uh, something like 25 or sub exposures and I was using a Canon DSLR. The image was very small on the fairly large chip, like a 23 millimeter chip. So in this case, I had to uh, crop it and then blow it up by a factor of about four. And you can see also that there are at least four other faint galaxies in the field, like two above it and then one directly to the right beside that bright star. And the refractor I was using uh, is not a fully color corrected, uh, like it's not an apple. And as, as uh, Jim was saying, that it, that it does mean it's a little bit of chromatic aberration. You can see a bit of a, a blue tinge there. And a fringe killer would have killed that. The one thing I might mention to Jim, that I have a really old broadband light pollution filter, which was made in the days where low, uh, low pressure sodium was the most common light, light fixture. So there's a notch in the yellow. But those things actually do very well at both fringe killing and producing nice contrast on planets because uh, they also cut out the blue and violet end of it, which is where the mercury vapor lights have a lot of their emission. So using one of those broadband light pollution filters sort of does a double duty. It increases the contrast and acts as a fringe killer too. I, I, a few other people I know, I've read about have noticed that, noted that fact. So um, I guess that's it. That's the last image I have. So I guess over to Chris. Thank you, John. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris and uh, spotlight your video. There you go. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think if people recall two months ago, we heard from Paul, we had all been excited about the great comet that was going to uh, be naked eye during the sky and Paul explained how it wouldn't happen or how it fizzled. Uh, so last month he got us excited by, uh, by Comet Swan and promised that it was going to be spectacular and, and uh, a naked eye, though low in the sky. So with that promise, uh, I was very pleased when uh, Paul invited me to come out with him for two nights along with Taras to attempt to, uh, to image it. And he's explained to you uh, the difficulties we had, the compromise between waiting longer for the comet to rise in the sky, but the, the sun being there. But uh, someone like myself that doesn't have the vast experience of Taras and, uh, and Paul, uh, just simple exposures, I was actually pleased to, uh, to capture the, uh, um, the, the, the comet. Mm -hmm. it a, another version again uh, with a plane flying through it. Uh, mm -hmm. So even though it was a disappointment, uh, I really enjoyed the process of going out and, and struggling to find it and trying our best to, uh, to capture it uh, with some success. And same time, uh, building on the theme that others have talked about, uh, uh, particularly being up at our cottage recently, there's been some um, spectacular uh, sunsets over the last time, the last month, and lots of co fellow cottagers uh, showing images. Um, and they coincided with this conjunction of Mercury and Venus. So the next image I have here um, was actually particularly pleased with because I managed to capture five planets in the sky, uh, five planets at the same time, even though there were only two in the sky and there was nothing wrong with my optics. So as you see above the trees, 
I managed to get Venus and two more versions of it reflecting in the lake, as well as Mercury and another version of it down in the lake. So uh, five planets in one shot. <laughs> and then a close up of uh, Mercury and Venus as they were uh, setting over the trees. My horizon is five degrees, so uh, I didn't get very long to, uh, to capture images of those. Uh, and that's it. Mm. Sorry, I had myself muted there. Okay, so um, let's take a look. We have some challenges, thanks to Oscar here. So last month, our beginner uh, challenge was M51. Intermediate challenge was April 36. UGC 5470 was the advanced, and the lunar challenge was the Crater and Monty's Archimedes. And uh, I'm glad to see that we did get some images of these, so that's super. Next slide. So our deep sky challenge this month is uh, Messier 64. It's a black eye galaxy. It's around eighth magnitude. And uh, this will be the beginner challenge for this month. Next one. Intermediate challenge is NGC 5529. It's a spiral galaxy in boots. It's 11th magnitude. And our advanced challenge is the Planetary Nebula in Sagittarius, NGC 6578, that's 13.5 magnitude. And then our lunar challenge is an, an ancient lunar impact crater, Crater Katharina. It's located near Rupees Altai. It's 100 kilometers wide and 3.1 kilometers deep. And here's a summary of these challenges. These will be posted on our website. And you can also take a look at these when the video gets posted uh, from this tonight's meeting. Next slide. OK, so our uh, members only Fred Lawson Observatory is open, uh, but the buildings are closed. And currently in Ontario, we're not supposed to gather with more than five people. So maybe exchange some emails just to make sure we're not uh, getting too big a crowd out there. And of course, we should always respect the physical distancing rules while we're out there. Well, Estelle doesn't have a pick because the library is closed and uh, because it's located within the museum. Hopefully at some point we'll get back to that. Here are the people that uh, look after your club and uh, uh, thanks for all the work that they do. We have, uh, I think we got up to about 106 people, peaked at that, 107 people tonight. Uh, thank you to everybody, uh, the organizers and speakers for tonight. And thank you to the RAC National Office, uh, who's uh, loading us their Zoom account to allow us to do these uh, meetings. Um, fortunately, our post-meeting entertainment is not available right now, so have a beer at home. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, regular membership is $88. Family membership is $82.50 plus $15 an adult and eight, 10 a youth, and youth memberships are $53. Now, at this point in time, if you're having uh, financial challenges, as many people are with the, all this COVID stuff going on, and you need some assistance with your membership, please don't hesitate to contact our local president here, uh, president at ottawa.rasc.ca, and we'll see what we can do to, to assist you with your membership costs. Other membership benefits um, is that we have the Ted Bean Telescope Library that you can borrow telescopes from. We have the our private observatory located on the Mill of Kintail out near Almont. Um, and once our library reopens, you'll have a, an opportunity to borrow books from there. Additionally, as a member, uh, you do get Sky News every two months. You get the journal every month, the Observer's Handbook once a year. And uh, we have our amazing local, locally produced astronauts. And uh, that goes out electronically. Okay, so our next meeting is uh, Friday, July the 3rd, and it will be again on Zoom. And uh, Jeremy uh, Kazub, you remember when he did his whole thing on auroras, it was quite fascinating. Uh, he's gonna be focusing on how, how to photograph the auroras. So that's the plan for our, our July meeting. 
And the other thing I'm looking for for the July meeting, in addition to observations, is I would like to have um, folks share some of their favorite gadgets or favorite modifications that they've done to their equipment uh, to share with others. So if you've got some ideas, please uh, send me an email to meetingshare@ottawa.rac.ca, and uh, uh, so we'll have like a gadget or a handyman corner or something like that. I've, I've got to figure out how I'm going to pull all that together. And so that is uh, July the 3rd. And on August the 7th, uh, we have Paul Cloninger doing astrophotography. And I've just confirmed today that we are having Dr. Christian Sass, who is in charge of the Eye Telescope Network. Uh, he's going to talk to us at our September 11th meeting. So any ideas for meetings or speakers, uh, please send them to me. I'd be happy to, uh, to slot you in. So thank you for coming out tonight. And are there any more slides, Chris? That's it, Dave. And you managed to pull this off virtually dead on in schedule. Congratulations. OK, thank you. So thanks, folks. We'll see you next month. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you on July the 3rd. Have a good night.